we're looking for the Tibetan Peace Garden, which I think is just here. So I'm here in the Tibetan Peace Garden near the Imperial War Museum, and today we're back out river hunting. Yes, river hunting must be one of my favourite pursuits in the world, bar any, really. It's going to be, I love it, I love it so much. The excitement I get when heading out here is uh, tangible, is intense. I can feel it. And today's Lost River, some of you will have known this by now, some of you will be working it out. It's the River Neckinger. The River Neckinger. Not a great long river at all, but a very important one, and one that is full of stories. The minute I saw this route on the map when I marked it out earlier in the week, I started to get really excited about it. And it's played a big role in the shape and the evolution of this part of London. This walk's got everything. It's got a ruined abbey, a lost island, it's got Chaucer, Dickens, all sorts. Also a bit of uh, Dex's Midnight Runner. <laughs> Probably uh, not far away from the start of the walk. So apparently, there was uh, one of the uh, Civil War fortifications in this, what is now this park here. And according to an author called Guy Mann's Abbot, you could find uh, remains of the earthworks of the Dog and Duck Fort as late as 1974 in this uh, Tibetan Peace Garden, or what is today the Tibetan Peace Garden. Which is a nice paradox, isn't it? That here was once a fortification, part of a line of fortifications, that we will partly be following. They must have uh, somehow used the, 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 the shape of the river to inform the lines of communication between the forts. St George's Fields has a very interesting history, a very long history. There's evidence of a, of a Roman settlement here. It's also where um, the Southwark Martyrs were burnt at the stake in 1557. And then later, in 1780, the Gordon Riots started here, on St George's Fields, and they tore London apart for seven days straight, sacking and burning. And at one point, the words King Mob were daubed on the wall of Newgate Prison. And that's expression that has come down to us through the uh, ages. What is now the Imperial War Museum was once the Bethlehem Hospital, or Bedlam as it was known, in one of it, at least one of its incarnations anyway. We saw one of the sites of uh, the Bethlehem Hospital on the walk last week, didn't we, along London Wall, the earlier incarnation. There are a number of old accounts of the course of the Neckinger, and they're mostly kind of uh, like narrative accounts or broadly descriptive, but they say it rises here on the west side of St George's Field, and then it follows the line of Brook Drive down to Elephant and Castle. Then it just says it sort of flows through the Elephant and Castle, but I think it may follow Newington Causeway, and then it goes across the old uh, Dover Road, the road out of London Bridge where there was a milestone, I think this is where we encountered Chaucer on his way to uh, Canterbury on the pilgrimage. And then from there it follows the line of um, Abbey Road or Abbey Street where Bermondsey Abbey was. And then it uh, kind of created a, an island, um, Jacob's Island. But also obviously Bermondsey was once an island going back in time. And looking at the map of Roman London that I picked up at the Museum of London last weekend, that really shows the extent of how much of the modern street plan around Bermondsey and the, and the north part of Southwark was actually underwater in the, lone, in the Roman period. Bermondsey, E-Y on the end, denotes an island. And then even later, the, uh, the monks of the abbey, they cut channels there to feed their mill. And uh, that created an island called uh, Jacob. It was called Jacob's Island. I think it may have had a different name as well, which I'll pop on the screen. But we'll do that when we get down there. So the first part of the walk now is from this west part of, of uh, St George's Fields. Imperial War Museum, There's some sort of Soviet monument here, we'll take a look at that in a minute. Then we'll go down Brook Drive and let's see how we go. There's actually an interesting little bit of uh, trivia down there, a bit of music trivia that John Paul Lynch sent to me on Twitter yesterday. 
So this is a monument to the 27 million Soviet service personnel and civilians who died during the Second World War. It's an enormous sacrifice, isn't it? There have also been uh, commemorations of Holocaust Memorial Day here as well. If you went up here along Kennington Road, you'd find at least one of the houses associated with Charlie Chaplin. He was uh, born and raised in the area. But we're going to the left here, down Brook Drive. Bit of a giveaway, really, that name, isn't it? This is an area with an incredibly rich history. I made uh, a video of three walks I did, actually, around Kennington with my good friend uh, Keaton Stone. <laughs> Keaton Stone, who had his pyjamas taken by Buzz Aldrin, and he's got photographs of Buzz Aldrin wearing his pyjamas. That is the most astonishing thing in the world. I've also said to Keaton that he must now write an autobiography called Buzz Aldrin Stole My Pyjamas. I'd say this new development here is evidence of a Second World War bomb falling on the site because either side of it you've got this kind of fine Victorian houses and you've got a block here with relatively modern buildings. It's usually an indication that a bomb fell here. You can see here aligned with the end of Brook Drive and the course of the Neckinger. It's one of the enormous mega structures that have been imposed upon Elephant and Castle. We've got a former pub here called Two Eagles House. I guess that was the Two Eagles pub. And just across the road, this row of what would have been a little row of local shops servicing the area. Just to the south of the Neckinger, you've got Sullivan Road here, which is an interesting little sort of conservation area. It's quite a quaint little spot, this. I think that's in my Kennington video. This would have all been very marshy land for a long time. And I suppose the, the Neckinger, rather than rising on high land, which is a pattern we often see, isn't it? When we walk through the fleet, we started on very high land. That's a kind of standard course for a, a lost river, or any kind of river really. Even in Leytonstone with the Fillybrook, we start on high land on the edge of Epping Forest and follow it through. I think here it's more a case of the, of the stream emerging from this, this marshy land here, making its way down through the marshes to the Thames. I nearly forgot to look out for it. So this corner here of Hales Street and Brook Drive is where they shot uh, some scenes for the uh, famous, iconic video for Dex's Midnight Runners' Come On Eileen, the anthem of many a school disco. I believe it was shot here. According to John Paul Lynch, he sent me a, a still image of the scene taking place outside that shot. I guess we pass through this new development here to the Elephant and Castle. Elephant and Castle was one of the real sort of iconic areas of London, isn't it? The Elephant, Elephant and Castle, the pink elephant in front of the shopping centre. Sadly, no more. The Elephant and Castle is being massively redeveloped and not necessarily in a good way. And I think there's been a lot of shabby treatment of tenants around here, and I think saying shabby treatment I think is probably an understatement to what some people have called it particularly on the Haygate estate it was a very controversial redevelopment and the tenants there have had a really hard time of it uh, I won't do their plight justice here but if you go on YouTube actually and you just look for Haygate estate there are a number of videos about what's happened on the Haygate about the redevelopment about what's happened to the, the residents there the way they've been decanted out of the area out of London in fact it's not a good situation at all. But this is what we're dealing with now. So you can see the elephant, the old shopping centre now, I believe, is being knocked down. And actually, the pink elephant is still there. So this became a really popular shopping area in the early years of the 20th century. Apparently it was known as the, uh, the Piccadilly Circus of the South. The shopping centre here, when it opened in 1965, 
was the first covered shopping mall in Europe importing the, uh, the trend from America. But really the shopping malls are the evolution of the old Parisian arcades, the covered arcades. It's very sad what's been lost with the Elephant and Castle. You may not lament the passing of the architecture, let's be honest. Probably not the greatest building in the world, but what is being lost is the culture that it created. It was an incredibly kind of diverse range of traders and storeholders that operated in and around the Elephant and Castle shopping centre that reflected the kind of demographic of the area. And that culture is going to be lost when, I don't know what they're going to do, I imagine they're going to build some sort of Westfield type development. Roman Watling Street passes through Elephant and Castle on its way to the river. The old London College of Printing here, now part of the University of the Arts London. This thing's got a slightly sinister vibe to it, hasn't it? Like a load of Cybermen are going to come bursting out of here any minute. I, uh, I was watching Doctor Who with my son last night. It's the episode where Jodie Whittaker bumps into the Doctor from another timeline in the past that she doesn't remember. It's a really profound episode. I'm sure it's setting up something quite dramatic to resolve itself at the end of the second season. is the way we're going. There's the shard in the distance. So we're here. I'm going to go down Newington Causeway and then look for the old milestone on the old Dover Road. Of course this area was once all known as Newington. You still see it on some of the modern maps even. The books I'm using don't really describe the course of the Neckinger between Elephant and Castle and Bermondsey Abbey and Abbey Road. There are a couple of reference to points that would have been markers on the street plan that have now gone, such as, well, places where you could have crossed the river and Chaucer water these horses at a point which I believe is somewhere along near the end of Newington Causeway, I think. And I did see in my reading last night a reference to Newington Causeway. That's why I think this is the way we're going. When you're talking to your camera actually like this, you'll notice my eye line is wandering all the time. So I'm trying to <laughs> avoid people, traffic, lampposts, bikes, all sorts of stuff. And I, and I also believe that this was one of the lines of communication that linked the Civil War forts as described by Guy Manns Abbott in his uh, essay that I read in, um, in the Architectural Association magazine. I think it was published in 1999. But I think a full account of it is in a book called Rebel City, which I don't have. I believe it's called Rebel City, but that's a brilliant essay. I am going to walk the northern part, well, the eastern and the northern part of those civil war defences at some point, maybe over Christmas, New Year. So that's an amazing walk that I've been wanting to do for a long time. I wrote about it in, I think, 2005, which I'll link to below with a number of other links. One of the forts... One of the Civil War forts was said to be along here, near the Ministry of Sound. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? There's a big queue up here for something. I wonder what it's for. So I think this here is like a, a food market here, like a, a food centre, like an open street market type thing. It's got a big queue, but that's probably down to social distancing and controlling numbers. This uh, grand building here is the Inner London Session House or the Inner London Crown Court. It's quite an imposing building. Looks like Portland Stone as well. So New into Causeway is leading down to uh, the borough down there, but I'm tempted to try some of the back streets off here. It's one of those decision points, isn't it? I think I'll play it safe because we haven't got an enormous amount of daylight left, probably about half an hour in fact. So Newington Causeway has given way to Borough High Street. Well the reason I come here 
is I want to pick up the point where Chaucer stops to rest his horses and drink from the Neckinger. Of course, the George Tavern down there just off Borough High Street is famous for its association with the Canterbury Tales and the, and the start of the journey to Canterbury of Chaucer and his pilgrims. And I believe they stopped somewhere here at the start of the, uh, of the Dover Road, and that's the Great Dover Road just over there. So let's check the text, shall we? So this is uh, Springs, Streams and Spars of Old London by Alfred Stanley Ford. He was very useful when doing the fleet walk. And so what does he say? He says uh, there was a bridge, bloody bloody blah. blah. Uh, it was at my southern point of the boundary of the Borough of Southwark, and in ancient days the first halting place out of London on the road into Kent. Chaucer's pilgrims passed it on their way to the shrine of St Thomas a Becket at Canterbury. And forth we ridden a little more than pass until the watering of St Thomas. I'm trying to do a Chaucer and voice. I'll just read it straight, actually. And forth we... Ro we uh, and f See, I can't do it straight. And forth we ridden a little more than pass until the watering of St Thomas. And there our host began his horse's rest. Obviously, I've interpreted that how I think it should sound. So the Neckinger was formerly navigable for small craft from the Thames to the precincts of Bermondsey Abbey and gives name to Neckinger Road which is at a short distance southward of Jacob's Island. So this is from the prologue to Canterbury Tales and it could be here I think and I think our journey goes down there down Long Lane, which connects us to Abbey Road, which is where we know the river ran. The great uh, Victorian historian of London, Walter Besant, he wrote that section of the Neckinger where it crosses the Kent Road. But it crosses the Kent Road. Now, is that Old Kent Road? Is that Watling Street, which is the road to Kent? Is it the Great Dover Road? I don't know, but it's obviously around here somewhere. He said that this section of the Neckinger was called Canute's Trench and the reason for that was that it was dug out or widened by King Canute in 1016 during his attack on London in order to be able to bypass the heavily defended London Bridge and they could use the Neckinger to go around London Bridge and in one of the accounts that I read I think it actually might be the um, the old London spas, baths and wells, that the Neckinger once joined up with another river, possibly is it the Earl's Sluice, I can feel Tom Bolton judging me at the moment, uh, that then carried on to Waterloo. So just carry on along the southern section here and then join the Thames beyond London Bridge. It's an intriguing idea, isn't it? And I believe that the, um, the Neckinger was used in order to drain the water level when they, uh, they built the new Tower Bridge, when they built Tower Bridge there. So there could be some... Uh, could be some validity in that story. So now we're walking along Canute's Trench. And here we have Kipling Street that runs through the Kipling Estate. Did some filming around this area for about eight months. It was a magical experience. I was filming with the uh, Tenants and Residents Associations and community groups here. And they, I heard about the strong association with I don't know why Kipling is mentioned so much. I can't remember that story, but I know Charles Dickens spent time in the area and Dickens wrote a lot about Bermondsey. What I'll do, I think, at this stage, rather than badly try and remember some of the wonderful things that people told me and the great characters that I met, making that film with the residents here. It's a film called In the Shadow of the Shard. I'll put a link below. It's here on YouTube. It was a magnificent experience. And um, I will drop some little clips in here at the relevant points. I did film here on the Kipling Estate, put a bit of that in there. My name's John Paul Maytum. I am the resident chair of Leather Market CBS, that's Community Benefit Society. Uh, we're the people who are building new homes in the Leather Market area of London. What we're trying to do is build, in this case, 27 new council homes a few hundred metres from the Shard in the middle of London. Because uh, people here really strong community around here, very strong, fantastic tenants and residents associations and brilliant resident activists who really keep this a very vibrant, connected community in the face of, well, what you can see all around you, like rampant development. It was a very kind of life-affirming experience making that film.
and it was while making that film down here around Bermondsey and Canada Water that I really became interested in learning more about the neck injury because you'll see it's got a very dramatic end to this walk as we see the river at St Saviour's Dock and I walked around there and I thought hang on a moment there's more going on here we've got Tanner's Yard in here of course that was a big feature of the area this part of Bermondsey became known for its tanneries you know its leather works um, there's leather market back there the leather market building and there's an interesting record of when the industries that grew up here that used the water of the Neckinger, Bermondsey Abbey, which we can see just up ahead, that obviously was taking the water for its water mill. And so a dispute arose between the tanneries and the other industries using the water from the Neckinger and the Abbey. So they're saying you're taking the water too much and there's not enough water left in the stream for us because it would have been tidal and it filled twice a day. And I think the resolution was that the, uh, the tanneries eventually, uh, I think they won that dispute. <laughs> there was a vinegar works here, the Sarsons Vinegar Works. I imagine it was pretty, I imagine it was a pretty stinky old area. So here we are at the end of Bermondsey Street. Bermondsey Street now has become a real foodie street. It's a real, you see it now, it's full of people who come down here for various restaurants and bakeries and coffee shops and all sorts. I shall hand you over at this point to uh, the wonderful John Paul Lynch who walked me around this area and told me about some of its history. I, I won't do it justice, but John really knows his stuff. Yeah, this is Bermondsey Street, which is an extremely old street. One of the oldest streets in the country, apparently. Goes way back. But this is the sort of front line of change. This is, if you want to judge how much Bermondsey's changed over the last 20 years or less, just have a walk down Bermondsey Street. I mean, this was always a working street. The Bermondsey Workhouse was located just over here where Tanner Park is. I think that closed the first decade of the 20th century. This is Tanner Street. This is, as in Tanner, people, there was uh, workshops where hides used to be processed, as in Tanner is. And also, as I said, the Sarsons Malt Vinegar Factory was down the end. So I knew someone I went to school with used to live in the flats down and used to say the stinks was unbelievable. One side you had the vinegar, the other side you had all the hides be tanning and it was uh, not very nice. So we are now on Abbey Street, which is where Bermondsey Abbey once stood. I believe the site of the Abbey was over there in Bermondsey Square. It said there was an Abbey on this site even before 714 AD. That's a very long time ago. So quite when the Abbey was established, I'm not sure. We've got ourselves a blue plaque up here. What does it say? Bermondsey Abbey formed as a priory of the Order of Cluny stood here from 1082 to 1538. I think this is where I will hand over to Gordon S. Maxwell. The Great Abbey of Bermondsey. When the Saxon Thane Bermond became possessed of lands south of the River Thames several hundred years before the Norman Conquest, the exact date is unknown, he found his new estate little more than a number of marshy islands intersected by small watercourses that flowed down to the main river. On the largest of these islands he built his house and cultivated the land, and from this place arose the name of Bormans E, or Island, a name to this day practically unaltered. So well did this Saxon chieftain and his successors in the course of time improve the land by draining many of the small streams into one large river, later on known as the Neckinger, that what was known formerly as marsh became pasturage for cattle and fields of corn and the meadows surrounding the then lonely farmstead became some of the most fertile near London. It was not until 1089, however, that Bermondsey Abbey was really founded for in that year William Rufus gave the property to the Cluniac monks from the famous French abbey of La Charité sur Loire, who added many new buildings to suit their needs. 
the abbey grew, and in 1430 more buildings were erected to keep pace with its rapid extension. It was now at the zenith of its power, and the fame of Bermondsey Abbey spread far beyond England, till it was one of the great forces that swayed not only the religious, but also the political life of medieval Europe. Churchyard of St Mary Magdalene Bermondsey. I always used to believe this was connected to the Abbey, but not so. So, Abbey Street, which is just to my right there, which is the course of the Neckinger, would have run along the southern side of the Isle of Bermondsey. You can imagine a kind of network of, of rivers and inlets, and then later when some of that land was drained, and the abbey took up residence, they cut a number of channels to feed, I guess to feed grazing land or to feed to channel water to the mill. So it would have been a very, very different landscape to what you see today. An awful lot of this land here in Roman times would have been underwater, as I mentioned before, which is an astonishing idea. When you see that map of Londinium from the Museum of London, it shows the extent of the land that was underwater. It's a vision of a different city. It reminds me of the lost city of Dunwich, which is now lying beneath the water. It's the reversal of that now. And all that water was drained away and land that's been reclaimed. And there's another plaque here to commemorate the site of the abbey on the uh, end of this housing block, the end of Tower Bridge Road. Ah, if you were looking to get in the festive spirit, here it is on this van here. This truck is being driven by a real Santa. Seems to be advertising the local restaurants. Isn't that great? So it's said that this section of the river here, up to Bermondsey Abbey, was navigable by small craft. So you can imagine the boats making their way up in the Middle Ages from St. Saviour's Dock up here to the Abbey. This road here is literally just called Neckinger. It's not called Neckinger Street or Neckinger Road or Neckinger Place, just Neckinger, as if this is the river. And that is actually the way I'm gonna go down there beneath that bridge. The St. Saviour's Dock is just on the other side. So I think it's at this point here where the, uh, the channels that had been cut by the, the monks of the abbey created what was called uh, Jacob's Island, or Jacob's Isle. And it was an island for quite some time, I believe. I think it was even evidence of it, certainly at the end of the 18th century, possibly even into the early 19th century everything kind of over there that would have been on the island this is possibly the greatest street name in london druid street what an amazing name so i actually think i made a mistake back there it's the uh, it's the land on the other side of Jamaica Road here, which is uh, where Jacob's Island was. I think I'm sure someone will correct me in the comments. I mean, I could just record that whole piece again in the correct place, but I like to leave my mistakes in. <laughs> I mean, I make these mistakes when I walk. And you know, now we know where it is. It's the, it's the other side of Jamaica Road. So Mill Street here, which I think was previously known as Millstream Street. That takes us right down to the dock and I believe is the course of the river. I'm pretty sure it is. So St Saviour's Dock is actually on the, uh, the other side of these old wharf buildings here. Most of which I think they're all sort of private flats now. So we just have to walk around and then we can access it from the riverside. So I think the route to the river is through here. So here it is, the confluence of the Neckinger and the Thames, where the rivers 
journey ends. And here's the Neckinger. It must be low tide at the moment. You can see there's no water in there. It was filled twice a day by the tide of the Thames. St Saviour's Dock all now posh private flats. But the river is still here. Isn't it wonderful? This scaffolding here is appropriate because it's said that the name of the Neckinger comes from the fact that this was a place of execution where Thames pirates were hung. And on the old maps, it showed the name as the Devil's Neckinger. The Neckinger being a, the term for a, like a neckerchief, a scarf that was tied around the neck. And the Devil's Neckinger was the rope that was used to hang the pirates at this spot here in St Saviour's Dock. Well, here it is, the end of the walk, where the Neckinger makes its confluence with the Thames, a sacred spot. Who knows what offerings were made here in the past. What a magical walk it's been. And thank you so much for joining me on this glorious walk along the River Neckinger. Another in the series of uh, London's Lost Rivers. These are great, aren't they? They always deliver. Please check out the other Lost Rivers of London walks that I've done. I'll put um, various links below. And what I love actually when I'm doing this in a very busy place is no one seems to mind. People walk past, they don't seem to mind that I'm doing this <laughs> at the beginnings of a bridge and they've got to dodge around me. And anyway, on that note, I'd just like to thank you for joining me on this magical walk. I'd like to thank my brilliant supporters on Patreon, all you brilliant people that come here every week and watch these videos. And as ever, I look forward to seeing you lot on the next walk, wherever that may be. Mm -hmm.